Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, another critical triggering video today. We're going to examine the position of the Koranites, the so-called Quran-only Muslims, and their claim that the Quran is sufficient. We don't need any Hadith in order to follow true Islam. Some people call them hadith rejectors as well. Today we're going to ask ChatGPT about that position, if it is congruent, if it is potentially even superior to traditional Islam. Guys, before we jump into the video, do me the favor and leave me a thumbs up if you enjoy my content. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and check out the links in the description box below to further support my work. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. All right, ChatGPT. Lately, we've seen a lot of content of so-called Quranists or Koranites, people that follow the Quran exclusively, or at least that's the claim, and they go somewhat against Sunni or even Shia tradition. Today, I want to examine if their claim holds any truth in reality, or if it is the superior claim even. So let's start with the first question. Let's get right into it. Is the Quran alone sufficient for guidance or do we need Hadith to fully understand Islam? The Quran is the primary source of guidance in Islam, but many scholars argue that the Hadith is essential to fully understand and implement Islamic teachings. The Hadith provides detailed explanations of how the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, applied the Quran in daily life covering aspects like prayer, fasting, and social conduct that are not fully detailed in the Quran alone. So while the Quran is sufficient in its message, the Hadith is seen as complementary for practical implementation. Got it. One critique of the Quranites would be that the Prophet, may peace be upon him, did not command his followers to write down Hadith. And therefore, the Quranites, some of them, not all, claim that Hadiths themselves would be an innovation. What do you have to say about that? It's true that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't command his companions to write down hadiths in the same way the Quran was written. However, the oral tradition of passing down the Prophet's sayings and actions was well established. The compilation of hadiths happened later to preserve this oral tradition as Islam spread. While the Quran was directly revealed and written down during the Prophet's time, Hadith became necessary to understand the practical applications of Quranic teachings. The Hadith provides context, examples, and details that are not explicit in the Quran, such as the exact way to perform Salah, prayer. Rejecting Hadith altogether could risk losing essential aspects of how to practice Islam in daily life. Yeah, that's very well put, but what would you say did the early Muslims rely upon? Because they didn't have Hadith, so what did they rely upon? In the early days of Islam, the Sahaba, companions of the Prophet, relied on their direct experiences with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They followed his example based on what they saw and heard from him. The Quran was their central guide, but the Prophet's actions, sayings, and decisions provided practical clarification on how to live out its teachings. Since they were living in close proximity to the Prophet, they didn't need written collections of Hadith at first. They relied on oral transmission and personal knowledge. After the Prophet's death, and as Islam expanded beyond the Arabian Peninsula, the need for preserving the Hadith in written form became more urgent to ensure that future generations could follow the Prophet's example accurately. This is when formal compilation efforts started, leading to the collections of Sahih Hadith we have today. Yeah, but exactly that is the point, because Hadith were compiled later, and therefore, my question would be, how can we trust the authority of all hadith if they've been compiled generations later? That's a valid concern, and scholars have addressed this through rigorous methods of hadith authentication. When the hadith were compiled, scholars like Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim developed strict criteria to ensure the authenticity of the narrations. They scrutinized the chain of transmission, Isnad, to verify that each hadith had been passed down through reliable, trustworthy narrators who were known for their integrity and memory. Additionally, they examined the content, matin, of the hadith to ensure it aligned with the Quran and other established hadith. Through this process, hadith were classified into categories like sahih, authentic, hasan, good, and daif, weak. While it's true that hadith were compiled generations later, 
This meticulous methodology was designed to preserve the authenticity of the Prophet's sayings and actions as accurately as possible. Not all hadith are considered equally reliable, but those that meet the highest standards are generally trusted by scholars and Muslims worldwide. I understand your explanation here. However, the response of the coronites would surely be that we cannot trust Bukhari, for example. Because how can we trust his judgment? He wasn't there during the time of the Prophet. And now he decides which hadith is weak, which one is reliable, etc. So the question becomes, how can we trust those people that later on compiled the hadith? That's a critical question. And the trust in figures like Imam Bukhari comes from the rigorous scholarship and transparency of their methodology. Imam Bukhari and other hadith compilers were not relying on their own opinions or judgments alone, but followed strict objective criteria when assessing the reliability of hadith. Here's why their work is generally trusted by scholars. One, chain of transmission, Isnad. Imam Bukhari and others didn't just collect narrations, they thoroughly investigated the chain of narrators. They checked each individual in the chain, whether they were trustworthy, known for their accuracy, and if they had direct contact with the people they were narrating from. The Isnad itself could trace the Hadith back to the companions who directly heard it from the Prophet. Two, biographical analysis. Scholars like Imam Bukhari compiled detailed biographies of the narrators to assess their reliability. If even one person in the chain was found to have a weak memory or be unreliable, the Hadith would be considered weak. Multiple chains, mutawatir. Some hadith were transmitted through multiple chains of narrators, known as mutawatir hadith, which gives them even stronger credibility because they were reported by numerous people independently. 4. Cross-verification. Hadith were cross-checked across different regions and communities to see if they matched. If a narration from Medina matched one from Iraq or Egypt with the same chain of narrators, it strengthened its authenticity. While Imam Bukhari and others came generations later, their work was based on this detailed and transparent methodology, which the scholarly community accepted. This doesn't mean every single hadith is infallible, but the system was designed to preserve the Prophet's teachings as accurately as possible. It's also important to note that the Quran itself speaks about following the Prophet's example, Quran 33.21. Since the Quran doesn't contain detailed instructions for all aspects of daily life, scholars argue that hadith are essential for understanding how to practice Islam fully. Now answer shortly, please. One to two sentences tops. You said that in the Quran we don't find detailed explanations. The Quranic standpoint on this is that we potentially don't even need detailed explanations. It simply says to prostrate to God, and everybody understands what prostration means. So therefore, they claim that God doesn't really care if you fold your hands or let your hands hang next to your body, if your hands touch the ground first or your knees. Ultimately, what is important is to prostrate to God. And this is something that we found with the Christians and the Jews in the early stages as well. What is your stance on that, that we potentially don't even need further detail and that the Quran is sufficient? Quran provides general commands, but without the Hadith, Muslims would lack the detailed guidance on how to properly fulfill obligations like prayer, fasting, and other key practices. While the Quran commands prostration, the Prophet's actions clarify how to perform prayer in full, ensuring consistency and unity in worship across the Muslim community. Okay, this was a very liberal, laid-back response that didn't go into detail whatsoever. I asked you if there is a potential, looking through the lens of the Quran alone, that God doesn't require more detail of the believers. Is this a possibility or is it just wishful thinking? The lens of the Quran alone, it's possible to argue that God doesn't explicitly demand detailed instructions for every practice, focusing instead on the essence of worship, such as prostrating in submission to him. However, this view is contested because the Quran also emphasizes following the Prophet's example, which provides those necessary details. So, while some may see it as a possibility, the majority of scholars argue that the Prophet's guidance is crucial for properly practicing Islam. Yeah, I absolutely agree with this, but let's take our bias aside. I really want to give the Quranites the benefit of the doubt, and therefore simply looking at it from the lens of the Quran. 
You, ChatGPT, you have access to the whole Quran, to every surah, every verse. So look into it and give me an explanation if the Quran itself truly claims that it is sufficient by itself and that we don't need any outside source. Really go through the whole Quran and base your argument only on the Quran. No Islamic scholars, nothing like that. Looking directly at the Quran, there are several verses that emphasize its completeness and guidance. For example, Surah Al-Anam 638 states, We have not neglected anything in the book, suggesting that the Quran contains all necessary guidance. Additionally, Surah Al-Anam 6114 says, Shall I seek a judge other than Allah while it is he who has sent down to you the book, explained in detail? However, there are also verses that imply the necessity of following the Prophet's example to fully understand and implement the teachings of the Quran. For example, Surah Al-Ahzab 3321 says, Indeed, in the Messenger of you have a good example to follow for him who hopes for the meeting with Allah and the last day. While the Quran claims to be a comprehensive guide, it also emphasizes the importance of the Prophet's example in implementing its teachings particularly for practical matters like prayer. So, while the Quran contains essential guidance, it does indicate the need for the Prophet's example to fully understand and practice it. This is why most scholars argue that the Quran and the Prophet's Sunnah work together. I absolutely agree yet again. However, the Quran only Muslims will claim that the Sunnah of the Prophet or the example of the Prophet is simply the Quran itself. Could this be a possibility? And please answer only in one sentence. It's too long. While it's possible to interpret the Prophet's Sunnah as being synonymous with the Quran, most scholars argue that the Sunnah refers to the Prophet's actions and teachings, which explain and expand on the Quran, rather than being limited to the Quran itself. Okay, I wasn't asking you about scholars. I'm really asking you to look into the Quran itself, examine it, and give me your reasoning based on the Quran alone. As if there was absolutely no scholar ever in existence, because I want to see if the Quran alone argument is coherent within its own worldview, simply based on the Quran. My question is... Could it be interpreted that the Sunnah, the example of the Prophet, is actually the Quran? Looking purely at the Quran, there are verses that emphasize the Prophet's role as a messenger and an example. For instance, Surah An-Najm 53.3-4 states, He does not speak from his own desire. It is nothing but a revelation revealed. This could suggest that everything the Prophet says or does is aligned with the Quran. Additionally, Surah Al-Ahzab 3321 speaks of the prophet as an example to follow but the quran doesn't explicitly state that the prophet's example is solely the quran itself instead the quran implies that his actions explain or exemplify how to live according to its teachings suggesting that the sunnah complements the quran rather than being identical to it thus while one might argue that the prophet's example reflects the quran the text itself points toward the prophet's role in clarifying or applying its guidance Okay, let's stay completely objective here, as neutral as possible, and let's look at the development of Islam. Of course, you have schools within Islam that will claim orthodoxy and hence will claim that they haven't changed at all. But objectively looking at Islam, we do see certain developments. So therefore, my question would be, if we look into the modern day Islamic world, would you say there is a heavy emphasis on hadith that wasn't like that found in the early stages of Islam? Would you say that there is a potential for such a development and an overemphasis on hadith? Objectively speaking, it's possible to argue that there has been a greater emphasis on hadith in later stages of Islamic development compared to the early years of Islam. In the earliest period, the Quran was the central focus, with companions of the Prophet relying on their direct experience and memory of the Prophet's actions and sayings. As Islam expanded and the generations following the Prophet grew, the need to preserve the Hadith became more pronounced, leading to its systematic collection and study. Over time, the Hadith came to play a larger role in shaping Islamic law, Sharia, and practice, alongside the Quran. Some may argue that in certain contexts, this has led to an overemphasis on hadith, 
especially where it is used to address matters that may not be directly mentioned in the Quran. This shift reflects the natural development of religious scholarship as Islam spread to new regions and encountered new challenges. However, most scholars would argue that this emphasis is necessary to preserve the full scope of Islamic practice as demonstrated by the Prophet. Okay, if you look at all the hadith that you have access to and you look into the Quran and you analyze both works, would you come to the conclusion that there are contradictions between hadith and Quran? You. Upon analyzing both the Quran and hadith, there are instances where certain hadith might appear to contradict the Quran at first glance. However, traditional Islamic scholars typically engage in a process of reconciliation, where they interpret such hadith in light of the Quran or dismiss weak or unreliable narrations, known as da'if hadith, if they are clearly at odds with Quranic principles. In cases where a hadith directly contradicts the clear and unambiguous teachings of the Quran, it is either reinterpreted or considered unauthentic. So, while apparent contradictions may exist in isolated cases, the methodology of hadith criticism allows scholars to maintain coherence between the Quran and hadith in traditional Islamic thought. All right, does a thought experiment go through hadiths and pick two hadiths out that you find contradictory to the message of the Quran? And those hadith have to be sahih as well. Here's one commonly discussed example. One, the hadith on intercession, Sahih al-Bukhari. Some hadith suggest that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will intercede on behalf of sinners on the day of judgment, granting them salvation despite their sins. This has been debated against verses like Quran 248 and Quran 6164, which stress personal accountability and that no soul shall bear the burden of another. Two, right. the hadith on apostasy, Sahih al-Bukhari. There is a well-known hadith where the Prophet said, whoever changes his religion, kill him. This seems to contrast with Quran 2, 256, which says there is no compulsion in religion. Scholars have reconciled this by interpreting the hadith in the context of treason or sedition rather than individual belief, but it is a source of debate. These examples show how certain sahih hadiths might appear to conflict with the Quran's message, leading to ongoing scholarly discussion and interpretation to resolve such issues. Okay, taking all of that into consideration, looking at the Quran alone movement, what do you see? Do you see people that use a simpler, more purer form even that should get them closer to true Islam? Or do you see a risk in such practices and such negligence of the Hadith? The Quran alone movement may appear simpler and in some ways could be seen as an attempt to return to a purer form of Islam by focusing solely on the core text. However, there is a significant risk in neglecting the hadith as it removes the detailed context, explanations, and practical applications of the Quran that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, provided. Without the hadith, key aspects of Islamic practice, such as the exact manner of prayer, fasting, and legal rulings, become unclear or open to broad interpretation, which could lead to fragmentation and inconsistency in how Islam is practiced. So while the intention may be to simplify and purify, the Quran alone approach risks overlooking the essential role the Sunnah and Hadith play in guiding Muslims toward a complete understanding of the faith. But wouldn't you say that following Hadith can lead to sectarianism, or ultimately led to sectarianism, because different sects put different reliability on certain Hadiths? Yes, it's true that the Hadith can contribute to sectarianism as different sects place varying levels of trust in particular collections or interpretations of hadith. For example, Sunni and Shia Muslims often rely on different sets of hadith and have differing views on key figures, which has played a role in shaping their theological and legal differences. Even within Sunni Islam, various schools of thought may emphasize or interpret certain hadith differently. This reliance on specific hadith collections has indeed contributed to the development of distinct sects and schools. However, many argue that this diversity arose from legitimate scholarly debate and is a natural part of interpreting religious texts. The Quran alone approach seeks to avoid these divisions, but at the cost of losing the detailed guidance that Hadith provides for understanding Islamic law and practice. 
But looking at Islam in its purest sense, Islam means submission to God, and therefore anybody that submitted to God was a Muslim. That would imply Abraham, Noah, Moses, even Jesus, right? From an Islamic standpoint, all of those prophets were Muslims, they were believers in the one God. And therefore, my question becomes, looking at those prophets, they did have different practices, they did have different law sets, so the details were different already, but what unites them is the pure submission to God in this puristic sense, if you will. Based upon that, couldn't we say that the Quranists have a point? From an Islamic standpoint, you're absolutely right that all the prophets, Abraham, Noah, Moses, Jesus, were considered Muslims in the sense that they submitted to the one God. Their core message was the same, monotheism and submission to God's will. The Quran emphasizes this continuity of message, even though the specific laws and practices, Sharia, given to each prophet differed based on the time and context. Given this, Quranists could argue that the core of Islam is indeed submission to God, and that detailed rituals or practices, while important, may not be the essence of faith. They could claim that focusing on the Quran alone returns to that purer, more universal form of submission uniting believers across different times and laws under the principle of monotheism. However, the counterpoint is that the Quran itself was revealed in a specific context with a particular set of practices and laws meant to guide the final ummah community. The hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, provide the necessary details to fully implement this final revelation. While Quranists may argue for a simpler, more universal approach, mainstream Islam holds that the Sunnah, example of the Prophet, is crucial for applying the Quran in its complete form, in line with the final prophetic message. So, while Quranists might have a point about focusing on the essence of submission to God, mainstream Islam emphasizes that following the Quran and the Sunnah ensures adherence to the complete and final message brought by the last Prophet. Okay, let's wrap it up then. When we look at the preservation of the Quran and the Hadith, can we compare the preservation of the Hadith to that of the Quran or not? No, the preservation of the Quran and the Hadith cannot be directly compared. The Quran was preserved with exceptional care during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through both memorization and written records, and was compiled into a standardized form shortly after his death under the leadership of Caliph Uthman. This preservation process is widely regarded as divinely protected and without alteration. In contrast, the hadith were preserved through an oral tradition and were only compiled in written form generations later. While scholars developed rigorous methods for authenticating hadith, including scrutiny of the chain of transmission and the reliability of narrators, the process was not as divinely safeguarded as the Quran. As a result, hadith are classified into varying levels of authenticity, such as sahih, authentic, hasan, good, and da'if, weak, reflecting the fact that some hadith may be less reliable or even fabricated. Therefore, while great care was taken to preserve authentic hadith, their preservation process differs significantly from that of the Quran, which is regarded as perfectly and divinely preserved. Okay, so now taking that into consideration, answer only in one word. Can we trust Hadith? Unclear. Okay, expand in one sentence. Please don't go over one sentence and tell me if we can trust Hadith. The reliability of Hadith depends on the authenticity and strength of their chains of transmission. So, while Sahih Hadith are generally trusted, weaker Hadith require caution and further scrutiny. You, pretending to be a human being, based upon your AI knowledge, looking at hadith, the history of hadith, forgeries of hadith, etc., would you trust hadith? Yes, based on the rigorous methodology of hadith authentication, I would trust sahih hadith that have been thoroughly verified, while being cautious of weaker or unauthenticated narrations. 
Alright guys, and this is it for today's video. I really tried to stay as objective as possible. Matter of fact, I tried to give the Koranites the benefit of the doubt and somewhat create a positive case for Quran-only Muslims in order to truly examine the position. Moreover, to really look into the position to see if it is internally congruent, but ultimately, if you ask ChatGPT, even if you simply look at the Quran as a standalone, it wouldn't imply that the Quran proposes that there is absolutely no outside source of the Quran that can be used as well as an example. Because it is mentioned over and over again within the Quran that we should follow the example of the Prophet. And I talked about this previously on live streams, on videos, that if you look at the Quran, it's not like the Ten Commandments, for example. If you look at the Ten Commandments that came through Moses, then you could make the argument, okay, simply follow those Ten Commandments and you don't have to follow Moses per se. But with the Quran, it is very, very different, of course, because the Quran itself speaks over and over about the Prophet and that we should follow his footsteps ideally. Anyways, guys, this is it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, leave it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out the links in the description box below to further support my work. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace. Oh,